Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the l Wednesday lunchtime Celtic State of Mind Bulletin. Uh, I'm Colin Watt, and as always on a Wednesday, I'm delighted to be joined by my co-host, Amy Canavan. Amy, how are you doing? I'm all right, Colin. How are you? Yeah, doing good. And on this special Wednesday edition, we have a bit of a European taste here, all the way from Hungary, Kevin McCluskey. Kevin, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, Colin. Thanks. You can see he's not a, a Hungarian native, it's definitely a, a <laughs> Scottish accent. How long have you been in Hungary now, Kevin? Uh, I've been here for four years now, yeah. And my, Hungarian, my Hungarian's as limited now as it was four years ago, <laughs> sadly. <laughs> but something that is interestingly happening over in Hungary at the minute is the Euro Under-21 um, Championships, and we have Odson Edward playing. Now, it's split between Hungary and Slovenia, isn't it? But uh, Edward's French games have been, are taking place in Hungary. Have you managed to catch any of that on uh, national television? I, I haven't, actually, no. Um, I think mainly the games that have been shown here have been the, the ones in Hungary's group. So I've seen quite a few of the Hungarian under-21 games, but I haven't caught any of Edward's yet, unfortunately. And the last time I think I remember seeing you on the show was when Celtic played some Hungarian opposition in the Champions League earlier in the season. Remind us how that went again. <laughs> I'd rather not, if that's all right, Colin. <laughs> I still didn't think I'd get an invite back after that game. So. <laughs> but no, we've got a lot to talk about of what's happened over the last 24 hours. And you can see the one that is on your screen at the minute is the suggestion from um, the professor in Le Monde University. And we'll get Amy to give us the pronunciation as she did so before we got mm -hmm. on air um, of the professor that Celtic should move to League One, eh, League Un, sorry, in France, and um, to help the balance there. Now, Amy, what is the name of the professor again? Jean Pascal Guillon. That's impressive. Yeah. Mm. Well, you meant League League One, so League One. <laughs> so we'll just um, we'll go with that. So. Well, we did Spanish here on the West Coast. What was it when you were growing up, Kev? I had the choice of French or Italian. I added Italian. Ah, so... Which has obviously stood me in good stead for moving out to Hungary. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, um, Celtic suggestion um, that both their man Rangers move to League Un. Amy, we oui or no? No. No? I just... No, I'm not that um, enthusiastic about it. I think it's just... It's a bit of a weird one, isn't it? Um, I understand, you look into it and I get what he's kind of going off and obviously the, the Dutch and Belgian um, like amalgamation that's obviously spiralled it all on of course the TV deals as well in France are um, totally and utterly falling apart so I get where he's coming from and I get the logistic side of it again, it's just it's not so bad for the French they'd only be coming over here twice we'd be going over there a hell of a lot so um i get the foundations of it i do but i'm not um i'm not going to be an advocate of it certainly not kev what about yourself could you see celtic and rangers potentially making this uh, uh, is it a cross-border move because you'd say the cross-border yeah. moves to england this is sort of cross-continent now after brexit uh, to join up with the french league i don't think it could happen no i don't think so either um, and I really hope it doesn't. <laughs> kind of similar to uh, Amy's thought on that. There, like, as a fan, you couldn't make that trip to France 18 times a year or however many it would be to go and watch the games. So we've seen how poorly we play without the Celtic support this season. So I don't know why we would put ourselves into that position other than for money. Again, that's the only reason why they would move. I guess this is just another example, though, of the idea of Celtic's final position being out with Scotland. We've seen this move happening before. Um, I think it was Celtic tried to buy Wimbledon back in the day um, to find a route into the English Premier League. And Paul's been very vocal on this channel about how he doesn't believe that Celtic, potentially Rangers as well, will be part of the Scottish Premier League for much longer. Kevin, do you think that is part of the fact? Is that we've turned down this advance of the Atlantic League there's talk of a, a European Super League. Now, I mean, Dermot Desmond himself turned down the advances of this Atlantic League. We spoke about this months ago. Are Celtic yeah. still trying to work their way out of Scotland? Probably, behind the scenes. And I think it'll happen at some point. If I remember rightly, when I was on the show the last time, Paul and I did touch on this. And I think I think eventually it'll be inevitable that Scotland, the Celtic will leave Scotland and move down to England. I think that will happen, but I really hope it's not anything sort of like 
do you say cross channel or cross continental when we move into any sort of European league? Because first and foremost, we're a Scottish club. And we should be based and play our football here as much as we can. So mm. if we have to leave Scotland, the next best option would be something down to England, I think. Yeah, and obviously you mentioned that earlier, Amy, about the kind of amalgamation of the, the Belgian and the Dutch league. Um, I don't think there'll ever be a point where the Scottish league sort of integrates into the English football, but it does open the door for a team like Celtic to maybe make that move down south. Do you think that's probably more realistic than um, this, this professor, which you so excellently pronounced <laughs> his name, um, his suggestion of moving to France? Yeah, I think... Um... As Kess touched on there as well, I think and it is sort of inevitable that, that Celtic and Rangers will probably leave Scottish football. And obviously that is the, the discussion here. I don't think France is going to be the, the eventual destination. Yeah. But do I see us leaving Scottish football and leaving Scotland? Probably, yeah. Um, I don't know when, but the question's been brought up pretty much my entire time being a Celtic supporter. You talk about the last 10, 12 years, it really came quite to the, the forefront. I don't know how much it was obviously talked about beforehand. And it's just always sort of been this issue and it's debated a little bit. Then it goes quiet. Um, and and obviously the, the, the quest for 10, I think um, it, it, it sort of silenced it in a way that it was going to be, right, Scottish champions for 10 or no, but then it was that sort of, right, it's a, it's a one horse race for now. Of course they have to join England. So it's, it's, it's always going to be discussed until it does eventually happen. I do think it will. Um, and I do think we will eventually, um, like you see, join some sort of division in England. But no, I don't see it being a total Scotland and, and England amalgamation. No, I think it will just probably be um, ourselves and Rangers, yeah. I'm just going to bring up this point from David Kelly. And it says here, we're a Scottish team. If we leave the Scottish League, we are no longer Celtic. It would become like an NFL franchise style team. I can, I can accept that as well. I see Celtic as much as we've got our Irish heritage and our Irish background. We're based in Scotland, we're a Scottish team. Kevin, do we lose that if we move down to the, the Premiership, for example, down south or the lower leagues? I can't. I don't think if it was ever to happen that Celtic would jump straight into the Premiership. I think they would have to work their way up through League 2, League 1, etc. Um, but you see the likes of Swansea, Cardiff City, Newport, Wrexham, teams like that who have managed to make the move from Wales to England. Is that something Celtic and Rangers could do down south? Um... I think it's a different situation when you think about the Welsh teams because I think they've been in the English system for so long now yeah. that that's, it's, it's taken for granted that they're almost pseudo-English teams. I think if Celtic leaves Scotland, it's a very good point that we lose a bit of our identity. We're no longer Scotland's Irish team. We become another team in England. Um, and that might not sit well with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Amy, do we lose that Scottish touch if we move down south? I don't know. We'd still be based in Scotland, so uh, I don't know. You're going to have um, uh, you're going to have pros for it, and you're going to have cons for it. People will be really uh, um, against the idea, and I can understand that because when you've been a part of something for so long, you just it, and and it is, of course, at the end of the day, we, we are a part of the Scottish Premiership, and some people will never see past that. But it's all about progression. Um, we're talking about transition right now. You look at all these things that are going across Europe. Um, you just need to look at um, at the Netherlands and Belgium. Look at all these talks of this Atlantic lead, uh, league. Sorry, the whole rejig really of um, European competitions. Obviously, I think right now as well, and it's sort of pulling it back to the um, to the whole um, French connection. Is obviously the way that the coefficient's going right now. We're, we are looking at probably in the strongest place we've been in a few years, and, and at the end of the day, it's all about European development. Mm -hmm. So right now, there's obviously there's a lot of discussion about it because this Atlantic League, is really transatlantic league, whatever it is, is really sort of coming to the forefront, and there's a lot of big statements being made about that. So it is just going to be a question over the next few years, and I think I, do, I genuinely do think it is inevitable that we eventually will leave the, the Scottish League here. When you look at it, and you've just said there, it's inevitable that Celtic will leave the Scottish League. Do you see that happening in the near future, or do you think this is something that's still years and years away from happening? I've seen some of the comments come in, um, and they were saying basically this has been discussed since the 80s. So this is before both of us were born, and it doesn't seem to have made any progression forward. Do you think that will happen now sooner because of the effects of COVID um, and the way that basically Scottish football until this season was a one-horse race for the last nine years. Um, and 
let's be honest, teams like Hearts, Hibs, Aberdeen, if they were going to make that challenge to try and win the title, it would have been done when Rangers went in the league and they still got nowhere near close. And we just Is it just a point that we've outgrown Scottish football? I think it will come into play what's really happening across Europe and that's why I'm bringing up the Transatlantic League and all of that. And the reason that's probably more prominent now than it was in the 80s is money. It's fundamentally money. Um, these things always are. So it's going to, I don't know, there's all these things that domestic leagues really aren't really domestic leagues anymore. It'll soon become cross international leagues and internationalist leagues and all of this jazz. That's, it is a little bit, you're talking into the future. I appreciate that. And right now you could say it's probably still a bit of a non-starter, but it's not really because I do think we're, we're closer than we, we have ever been to it. I don't, if you're asking me to put a time frame on it, I really probably couldn't. Because uh, like I say, it would just, I think it's going to be, us leaving will be like a, the catalyst will be whatever happens in European competition. Kevin, the Scot, the sorry, the Celtic leave Scotland in in our lifetimes. Let's put it that way. Yes, it's a short answer. I think yes, I think we do. Um, as Amy says, I think there's definitely going to be moves being made just now behind the scenes for something like this to happen. The way the European or restructure of European competitions going. Teams like Celtic and Rangers are going to be marginalised from the major competitions. So if we want to improve our revenue streams, if we want to keep European competition and football going, we're going to have to find another solution. And I think the money men will make it happen within our lifetime for sure. I'm just bringing this point up from Lewis Laird and he's coming in saying, on board with the point of staying in Scotland and I agree with him. I, I'd, I'd hate to see Celtic leave Scottish football. Um, I think there's sometimes nothing better than going to um, teams like Berwick or Arbroath in the Scottish Cup and even the trips up to Dingwall and Inverness. I, I, I love going to those games. Um, but And you just can't imagine Celtic out with Scottish football. But it does seem, though, as these discussions continue and money ends up being the sort of common factor here, that eventually it will happen. But as you say, I'm, I'm not sure how many fans would be on board with it. Kevin, you, you said you think it will happen. Is it something that you would look forward to seeing Celtic outside of Scottish football? Personally, no, not right now. Um, I think I'm probably quite traditional in the way that I view football. So if you're a Scottish team, you play in Scotland. That's your domestic league and that's your bread and butter. I want to see Celtic progress in European competitions. And I want to see that by success at home first, winning the league, investing properly in the squad and pushing on through the Champions League like we should have done in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where I want us to see a European football coming. That's looking unlikely just now. So probably some restructure happens. It's inevitable, but I don't know if I fully support it. And as yeah. from a fan's point of view, it's just, I don't think it's fan friendly. And taking a look at it, I mean, the, the comments are very split. There's lots of ones saying, well, where would you rather be? Would you rather be at Berwick or would you rather be at Anfield? And I think for us, it, it will take quite a number of years if we do end up going down south to actually get up to the level that a lot of Celtic fans would expect us to be challenging at. A lot of Celtic fans have this theory that within 10 years, Celtic could be pushing for the title down south. Now, I don't think we're quite at that stage. I mean, obviously, you're opening the doors to the riches of English football. You look at some of the money that goes about down there, um, and it's understandable to see the clamour to get the teams to move to where the money is. But, Amy, I, I, I don't think, for me, I, I'd hate to see Celtic leave Scottish football. But going on what Lewis says, I think it's probably inevitable. Um, I wouldn't be for it. What about yourself? I'm, I'm similar to Kev, like I say, we both said it from the start, I do think it's inevitable, but I'm a bit of a traditionalist as well. I don't, I quite like you. It's, we're, we've been talking all about, for, for how many weeks have we been talking about the Scottish Cup, right? And all these, oh, you could face, like, there you go, Berwick Rangers, one that grows up at Dundee, um, you look at Brora Rangers with hearts, these are the fairy tale sort of stories that we all enjoy. And, and that's, it's not the fact that it's just a lower club, but it's the lower club of your local club. You know, there's going to be, like, so if it's Bonner and Grows, then it's going to be my local club. Colin, you're 
what are you green up or something green like up that morning, green up morning green up morning there we go there. there we go so it, it brings the local bit into it and if you go down south and that that's taken away of course it is Kevin will understand that obviously being out over in hungary as well is that whole it's not a, not necessarily a disconnect but you just lose that little spark so right now i, I certainly wouldn't want to be going but do i see it developing in a few years yeah i do because of money I'm just going to bring this point up because I think it's a great segue to another topic we're going to discuss. Um, and it's from a Facebook user. If you are um, putting your comment in through Facebook, you can do a one-step verification with StreamYard and it gets your name and picture up there. Um, maybe this user didn't want to do that. But in all fairness, the reserve teams of both Glasgow clubs would give the rest a run for their money. Now, this is a point we spoke about, um, I think, now for a number of weeks. And it comes around the idea that this is still on the table that next season, the Colt teams of both Celtic and Rangers could be in uh, League 2. Now, I can see Amy's already getting a wee bit agitated here. Um, a regular uh, listener to the show, a viewer of the show, um, Mo from East Kilbride, um, actually reached out to you, Amy, yesterday. Um, on, Is he from East Kilbride? Yeah, EK boy. I'm, East Kilbride. Do you know, I've never really... I, I know exactly who you're talking about, and I know the message, and I know and I know the Twitter. But I, know, I never even... That's the connection. <laughs> uh, but obviously the announcement, <laughs> the announcement was made yesterday that um, Kelty Harps were awarded the Lowland League title on a points per game basis after how many games were played in the league? So we played 12. So they played 13. Kelty played right? 13, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. yeah. And Brora Rangers were awarded the Highland League title on points per game after playing a fantastic amount of three games. Um, which is, if there was ever a scenario where null and void was um, the, the perfect answer, it was that league. But, Amy, I'll, I'll give you a sort of 30-second, maybe 45-second rant here. Um, taking Celtic out of it, Bonnie Rig Rose have uh, been lost out in this chance to gain promotion. What was the thoughts at the club? Like, you, you've got to award Kelly title. That's fair. The... Um... Last season, you know, they never got to go to the playoffs. And at the end of the day, we're all wanting to get um, get out of the Lowland League. So if it means putting a club forward for the, the playoffs, then of course we're all for that. And it's not better, but fair play to Kelly and, and all that jazz. Same with Brora. And it's right, obviously, both, both Brora and, and Kelly won, the, won their leagues last year. So it's only right that they really get a go at it. Obviously, this year, the whole place is second is, um, is a lot more enticing put it that way obviously if reconstruction comes around if the Colts get fired into League 2 then there's a the, the prospect that two from the Lone League would go up and two from the Highland League would go up now you only need to go back a couple of weeks um, and I was saying oh, well now I got the second because well we thought obviously we'd be going off a points per game basis oh, well if it was going off a points per game basis we I, I, well, not we, sorry, I was under the impression that it would probably over the last two seasons, the fact that last season's not really mat um, not mattered, but not really pushed for anything at all, really. Then, obviously, this year it's, we found out it's went down to the head-to-head. -head. Uh, sorry, it's not went down to the head-to-head. -head. We thought, I thought it would go down to the head-to-head, -head, uh, where we obviously beat East Kilbride. That's not happened. It's went down for points per game basis, on the same as East Kilbride, but East Kilbride have a three better goal difference than us. So sort of going down to fixture list but i'm not going to sit here and just rant about it at the end of the day it's not over yet because the reconstruction's not possibly not being totally fulfilled yet so when that comes around i wouldn't be surprised if a few other statements get chucked around but right now yeah just got fair play to broader fair play to kelly all the best in the playoff but it's a bit of a it's a bit of an odd one did that feel good getting that off your chest oh it just felt great <laughs> <laughs> so mo there is your update you, you asked for uh, Amy to come in and give us a, an update from the Bonnie Rig side. But it goes back to the point that the Facebook user was making. Now, if Celtic and Rangers, say, for example, were to leave Scottish football and the reserve teams were to get into League Two, does it ever come a point where the reserve teams end up being the dominant teams in Scottish football? Or is this just a kind of a, a pie-in-the-sky idea, um, which I think Chris Sutton said that the second biggest job after Celtic is Celtic Reserves. Um, when Brendan Rodgers took the Leicester job, Kev, you, you can see you smiling there. The, 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 the Colt teams, one, is it a good idea to introduce them to the league? And two, um, obviously, the, there's a setup where they can only go so far, but would they be some of the biggest teams in Scotland? Um, 
on the second one first, I think arguably they could be some of the biggest teams in Scotland. Because if you look at the players that don't make it in the first 11 at Celtic and Rangers of the, the match day squad, they would walk into most other teams in the Premier League in Scotland. So you put them in from the lower leagues and you would like to think in theory that they'll be successful and become, as you say, the biggest teams in the leagues there. Whether I think it's a good thing, again, being a bit of a traditionalist on it, I don't think it is. I can see the benefit for Celtic of doing it because it gives these lads first team football and puts them up against the men rather than the boys and they should toughen up and become first team ready for Celtic quicker. But I don't I don't like the idea of cult teams in the leagues. Um, it just doesn't sit well with me. And I think if you're a fan of a team in the lower league that's affected by that, do you feel that your league's been cheapened by Celtic and Rangers reserves joining it? And Amy, obviously you've mentioned before that you think that they should come in below the lower the sort of league two level they should come into the lowland league or potentially even below that um if this reconstruction comes in is it a good thing for scottish football for scottish football no as as kev says for Celtic and rangers yes of course it is as they've like i'm not going to rant on about it again because it's all i seem to do but i just think the, the best things the best things for these clubs ideally is when you, you get players on loan from like I say, I've touched on it. We've, we had great sign-ins from, from Hibs, Hearts and Livingston this year. I get exa- I get the whole fundamentals of it from the Celtic point of view. As Kev, just totally better than what he said. They're playing all together. They could be playing in this, the, the style that obviously the Celtic first team are playing in as well. Of course, you've got to play to your own strengths, but it's that whole point of staying together. And then it's not it's doing not what I'm suggesting, it's breaking them all up, sending them to X, Y and Z sort of clubs. They're playing against proper teams, um, really talented players, really talented squads, um, and it would be a wake-up call, it certainly would be. Um, as we've said, but the, the biggest thing is, the, the best thing of all would probably just be to bring the reserves in fact, that's not going to happen, so, but that's that's where we're at. So no, for Scottish football, I don't see it, and as Kevin says as well, it's that traditionalist. If I'm a, I don't know, a Cowden Beef fan or something like that, I'm not really wanting to see the Colts become one of the bigger sides or anything like that, because... It just it just doesn't sit well with me to be honest, and I'm not a fan of seeing any sort of cold side in any league, eh, not just if it be Celtic or Rangers. I totally understand from the club's point of view, everything it just seems positive, positive, positive. But um, from a Scottish football Scottish football point of uh, view, not so much. So then that that kind of rounds up the idea of the reconstruction of football in Scotland, where Celtic probably see their future out with. But they also see a point where their cult teams could be coming through as a sort of the Scottish element of Celtic. So you'd have the Scottish element with the reserve team playing in the lower leagues. And then ideally Celtic would love their first team to be playing in the championship and the premiership down south. Or maybe another one of these teams. And it just it does suggest to me that we are thinking completely outside the box. And I don't think our long term future in football is going to be permanently based in Scotland. But then... It all comes down to money, doesn't it? It's all about where the money's going to be. Uh, you saw the collapse of the French Football League with their TV rights deal this year, the amount of money that they lost. That could quite easily happen down south, Kevin. And then what happens? There's a suggestion here in the, the chat, and this is where I'm kind of looking to, is maybe it would be better for Celtic and Rangers to try and develop Scottish football and help Scottish football grow instead of seeing their future out with Scotland. Yeah, I think that's a, a valid point. I think when you look at England for you know, the last decade or so, 15 years, the TV deals have just been growing exponentially year on year. And at some point, that bubble will burst. Um, and I wouldn't like Celtic to be involved in that when it does. Mm-hmm. I also wouldn't like Celtic to be used as a lever to keep that going, because I can see that being potentially one of the reasons why the FA would allow Celtic and Rangers to move down south. Um, so but yeah, I mean, I think if we could somehow then to use our wealth in Scotland to develop the game here, that would be be a lot more beneficial. And I, I agree with Amy that what we should be doing is kind of developing our own young players, but putting them out on loan. So have a, a proper farm system of putting players out on loan for six months at a time, bringing them back and seeing how the development's going. That gives 
you know, like the Dunfermlins or Alawas or whoever, the chance to get a good young player for a while. It helps them, it helps Celtic, it helps the player. And yeah. I'm just going to bring this point up. Um, and David Kelly, I think, tried to say this a couple of times now. Holland and Belgium are merging leagues. This isn't two teams leaving one to join the other. This isn't what has been discussed on this show. It's apples and oranges. It's two different things completely. No, and David, to be fair, you're, you're correct. This isn't what um, is happening and this isn't what we're suggesting. What we're looking at is this is potentially opening the door. This is the first steps into what could be a completely normal thing in football. Because these two teams are merging, who's to say that the rules don't change, that teams can join different leagues? There's always been this idea of a European Super League that's been floated alongside the Atlantic League. And the fact that UEFA have basically given the go-ahead to trial this demo, I think for me it suggests that leagues might not be where this line stops. It could be teams joining to form a Super League of sort. Amy, I, I think this is basically the first steps and it's like, a lot of these teams are watching what's happening there to see what they could potentially do with their own club going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Let them be the guinea pigs. Um, if it all falls apart, then it's not on our uh, doorstep. But it's just, like you say, it is going to be something that if it takes hold across Europe, then it will eventually bleed its way out here. Of course it will, because it's just that domino effect and it's we keep going back to it, but it's money. Um, and if we want to be progressing, then we have to be a part of that. We can't be saying one minute, well, we're wanting all these progress to the next level like we're talking about competing with you know, Man Cities or whatever like that and it's, it's all it all comes down to, to progression and, and transition and just moving with the times really so it is, it's just going to be one of these things that is um, eventually going to say, come along Definitely and it's a big welcome to everyone who's joining us on Facebook, on YouTube and on Twitter today for the Lunchtime Bulletin on a Wednesday uh, we're close to 11,000 subscribers here on A State of Mind YouTube. So if you haven't already, please do so. Subscribe um, and you'll see some fantastic content across the channel. I believe that the Play On boys are back today for um, Scotland's match against the Faroe Islands doing the pre-match, halftime and post-match analysis. Something similar to what you'd see on a Celtic State of Mind for a Celtic game day. Um, so if you are part of the Tartan Army that are cheering on Scotland tonight, do get involved with Simi and the team there. And that's probably a good segue for us to take a look into one of our next talking points, which is the international football break, and take a look back at um, some of the performances from Celts playing for the national team so far um, over this break. Scotland play the Faroe Islands tonight, and I think that would round up everyone's contribution um, over three games in the space of seven days, which is a lot of football, to be perfectly honest. Um, but the first person I want to touch on here is Shane Duffy. Now, someone that has been completely sort of written out of Celtic's plans for the next few weeks um, and right through to the end of the season. Seen a lot of people saying that they would have cancelled his loan deal back in January and I have to agree, I think that would have been something Celtic should have looked into. But he plays against Qatar last night and looking at the reaction from the Irish fans, it was a, a sort of um, unanimous that he was playing well. Um, Amy, will we see Shane Duffy pull on the Celtic jersey between now and the end of the season? I can probably see him maybe pulling it on once or twice. Um, I wouldn't really put anything past John Kennedy um, at this stage. So, But would it be anything that's really merited? I don't know. You don't really want to be... I don't really want to be being too slight on him or anything like that, but it's just not worked out for, for Duffy here, has it? Um, I don't I don't know. There's not really... It's what it was at the beginning. Um, uh in the first international as well, you're looking probably around like October, November time. He, he was so out of form at Celtic, and he's, he's still then going and captain in Ireland while, while Seamus Coleman's out. And he was playing okay, it was nothing exceptional, but he was playing okay. And you're like, wow, he's just not really, something's just not clicking here. Um, no matter what it would be, if it's the, the magnitude of this, um, this whole opportunity, or just the, the pressures, I don't know. But yeah, he's looking more than comfortable in Ireland, um, and it's just, just not worked out here, has it? Kev, it's been a bit of a disaster signing, hasn't it? Everyone had this high expectation of him coming in and being the solid rock in defence we were all expecting, but it's been far from that, hasn't it? Uh, it's just one of those ones that hasn't worked out. That's right. I mean, um, I will I will say at the time, I wasn't a big fan of his signing because mm -hmm. I just I hadn't watched enough of Brighton to know how good or not he was. 
Um, and I did have the kind of feeling he's been signed because he's he's the big Irish defender and he'll get the fans on the side. And, um, you know, he's, he's, he didn't have much qualities, I don't think, that we were looking for. But on paper, he's a big lad. He should be dominant in the air and he should have walked it in Scotland because he's got, what, 10 years experience of playing down south against better opposition. So even although it probably wasn't a signing I was overly keen on, I'd still expected a, a far bigger reaction from him. Uh, so. Going on what we just discussed with Amy, do you think you'll, you'll see him pull on that Celtic jersey one more time before the end of the season? Uh, probably, because we've not really got very many defenders left. So mm. <laughs> I think at some point he'll probably need to make an appearance. But he definitely, uh, I don't think he'll be starting too many games. I think you've got to give well Shania um, the chance there at the back to build some sort of partnership. And we'll touch on Ayer's performances in a minute. Just, And I know there's a lot of Irish fans that do tune into this, um, so I do apologise for this next sentence, but losing to the, the game against Luxembourg kind of shows the level that the Irish national team have kind of dropped to. And we discussed this, um, myself, Kevin and, and Paul, at the weekend when we did a, a special weekend bulletin. Um, and quite a lot of people coming in in the comments saying, um, you know, it was only Qatar, it was only Qatar. I mean, for Ireland, a draw against Qatar is actually not bad considering the run that they're going on at the minute. Um, but when you, you take a look at it, um, I think Shane Duffy's time at Celtic has been a complete disaster from start to finish. There was a picture I seen someone tweet the other day and it said if you could sum up Celtic's season in one picture, and I think it was the game against AC Milan where he slides into Barkas. Um, and that was just basically our season in a, a nutshell. Um, but do I see him pulling on the jersey? Probably for that sort of emotional um, farewell, despite the fact there's no fans there. Um, I think Kennedy will maybe give him 15, 20 minutes towards the end of the season. Um, and if injuries kind of, kind of come around, then maybe we'll see a bit more of him. As you said, Kevin, we're, we're kind of light at the back. But touching on Chris Ayer, um, now he's had a bit of a mixed performance in his time away with Norway. Um, they were beaten 3 0 by Turkey. And by all accounts, from the feedback I've seen on Twitter and on social media, he was getting slaughtered for his performances. Um, but then, again, I think they went out and won against Montenegro last night. Um, and he said they played very well. And obviously, uh, one of our members here at Celtic State of Mind, Scotty Allcroft, managed to walk away with his jersey when they beat Gibraltar the other night. Um, Ayer is a, a long-standing talking point here on a Celtic state of mind, whereas if we could keep him next season, we'd make him captain. But there's a, there's also that sort of growing content across some of the Celtic fans where if the money's right this season, they would move on. What side of the fence do you fall under, Kevin? I would keep him, personally. I, but I think he's one of the more frustrating players that we've got in the squad. Because he's, he's definitely one that's got the attributes to be a top player. Um, but then he's also got that kind of Bobo Baldi or Effie Ambrose mistake in him as well. That we used to have. We just can't seem to get sort of con constant and consistent form out of him for a long period of time. But there's definitely there's definitely a top player in there. Um, and if we're going on the big rebuild that we're going on over the summer and losing up to 15 players or something like that, I think Ayer's one that we should be looking to keep then and um, try and build team around and Amy the, the, his kind of countryman um, Mohamed El Anousi or as uh, Kevin Graham likes to say him Mohamed El Anousi um, he also played the three games for Norway and it just shows that he's getting that sort of backing from his national manager um, to play him I think he's, he's played almost the next last seven or eight games for Norway he doesn't get that much game time at Celtic does that suggest there's a player there that we've just not seen so far uh, consistently at Celtic if you actually look at the way that Norway, uh, Norway sorry, shape up, Elinousi plays in a much deeper role um, than he does for Celtic. I'll be honest, I've not seen, um, I just, I've seen little, little highlights, um, but I've not seen um, any sort of extended clips from the game or anything like that. But yeah, he, he, is, he, he is playing it in a, a slightly deeper role. Norway are a great side right now. Um, if, if you've got... Now, albeit Haaland, I think, has maybe not scored in three games. How dare he not? Um, <laughs> it's crazy numbers. My God, get him gone. But, um, yeah, if you, you've got somebody like him up top, that makes a guy like Haaland Moose's job a hell of a lot easier. 
Um, there's, a, there's a top, top player and it's a top, top side. I think um, Martin Odegaard's just been made captain. It's a young, it's an exciting side. So Elan is actually probably one of the, the older heads. He's been in that Norwegian set for a long, long time. Um, when he was out in Europe, he, he made um, those international appearances really early on. So it's a place where he's comfortable with, of course it is. So yeah, it's good to see them both getting game time. And like I say, it's interesting to see Elan Nussi playing that little bit deeper. When you take a look at it, I mean, it could be available, figures I've suggested, for around £5 million this summer. Um, is it an investment Celtic should be looking to make, considering that if he continues this form that he's had with his country and we do this rebuild that we hope will get us back to the levels that we were at probably 18 months, two years ago, bringing in some um, quality strike force up front, getting the service to him, is he one that we'd be looking to keep this season? Or next season, sorry. Throw that to yeah, me. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Um, I, if it's five million or something like that, I, I would keep them. I really would. Um, I think it's something that we um, we, we could look at. And I just, I think right now, and and I keep saying it, how he's playing that a little bit deeper for Norway. I do actually think we're we're playing him probably out of position. Um, we will see that time time again actually that we don't maybe think he's a winger. Maybe he needs, to, and I'm not saying that he's going to be able to slot um in the midfield and maybe knock out. Turnbull or someone like that, but maybe that playmaker role is, is probably a little bit more made for him and a little bit deeper, a little bit narrow, because his, his pace is all right, but is his end ball quite there for the for down at the byline? I'm not, I'm not so sure. Yeah, I agree with you. I don't think he's a winger as such, um, and it will all come down to the formation that the new manager wants to play next season. Um, I think if you play in the sort of 4-2-3-1, then he would be the sort of number 10 behind whoever the striker would be. Um, and you saw even with the game at Ibrooks um, a couple of weeks ago, that sort of link-up play that he can have with the strikers, especially with Edward. It just depends who you bring in and play there. But I think if he's, I think he's only what 26, 27, you could probably get a bit of a sell on for him if he goes on to have a good sort of 18 to 18 months to two years at Celtic. Especially if Norway continue to be on the international stage, if he keeps feeding the ball into Haaland, then suddenly. Um, teams are looking at him and you might get back to that sort of figure that Southampton paid for him. So I think it's maybe an investment worth taking um, for Celtic over the summer. Moving on to um, Scotland. Now, Scotland, I mean, if you'd suggested that Scotland would get a two-each draw with Austria a couple of years ago, you'd probably have been laughed out of the country. Um, And the fact that we're now playing Israel um, for the 376th time over the last four years um, suggests that a one-each draw is quite frustrating in that element for the Tartan Army. But McGregor and Christie both started one game each. Kevin, is that a bit of a rotation thing from Steve Clark, or is it just that he's maybe looking for different players in different scenarios? And how impressed were you with the two Scots over the, the two games? Um, I'll be honest and say I didn't actually watch either of the Scotland games, so I can't comment on that side. Uh, I just couldn't find a stream for the games here, and they clashed with the hungry ones. So... Um, my, my loyalties lay elsewhere in those nights, uh, but I think I think Clark um, I think he does like to rotate a lot, and he does like to pick a team based on the opposition. Mm-hmm. So I don't think there's any uh, negative reasons for why McGregor or Christie wouldn't start both the games. I think it's just he's picked a team based on the opposition. I think he's done that kind of consistently throughout his time. But those two games, despite having not watched them, the results from those two games would be reason for me to kind of suggest that Clark's not the man for Celtic to move on to another topic on that one. Because <laughs> uh, I think the players that Scotland's got at our disposal are better than what Israel's got. And he's had what is it, four attempts in the last two years or something, or 18 months to beat them and hasn't managed it. I just I don't think he's a guy that gets the best out of a team. At the moment, he doesn't seem to know what his best to live in is for Scotland, um, which I think is a big issue for the national team at the moment. And Amy, it's, it goes back now, I think, to October last year when Scotland last won a game in 90 minutes against the, the Czech Republic, uh, a 1-0 victory. And you take a look at it and you go, Steve Clark's still being linked with these jobs. Is he completely living off the back of that penalty shootout win over Serbia? Looking at the performances of the last two games, it's not the kind of football I'd like to see Celtic playing, and hopefully that rules him out of the manager's job. 
I don't know. I do. I still think right now that the the Clark to to Scott, uh, to Celtic, sorry, is a bit of a, a dead a non-starter, and it's, it's it's just not really it's not really kicking around right now. I think he's got a lot to do still with Scotland. Um, you see, he's just a little bit slow. Um, Sean McGill, who I do. Um, Born and with oh my god that was that bad uh, and who who I rattle on about he's he's a he's a Kelly fan um, and and he said it for years it's like and everything that we sort of saw against Scot- Scotland with Israel that f- first what five minutes we were so so poor and we were so so slow we can see and that's when we kick it into gear and and Kelly were like that as well so it's not just it's not just the valleys at Scotland it's also what he done at Kelly and that's sort of a recurring theme and like you say that's not something I'd want to be bringing to Celtic. But then you look at that second 45 against Israel, and we're by, we were by far the better side. But it's taken until we concede to, to have a go at it. Um, and it's at, obviously it's sticking with that five at the back or three at the mm-hmm. back and five in the midfield, that three, five, two, whatever you want to call it. That's great when we're maybe not going to have the most possession in, in games. But look when we change that four, two, three, one against Israel, when we should be going at that. And, and we, were, we were exceptional. But we were really good, really positive play. Um, and it is, it's tricky. We've got a really hefty midfield in there. And I know you touched on McGregor. I thought McGregor played well the other night. When you've got McGinn in there, um, obviously he's trying to bring McTominay forward into midfield as well. And, you, and that's the issue we're talking about rotation. It's a really strong spot on midfield right now. I thought Christy actually played really well, especially in the first game against Austria. Um, I actually think he was better than Dykes. Um, Dykes is definitely going through a little bit of a lull period down at QPR. Um, and it's not the Dykes that we maybe had back in November, or October, November sort of time. Um, so it is. It's, it's interesting. Um, I can definitely see a lot of rotation tonight. Um, I don't really care who goes out tonight. I think this should be a win. Um, I know in my lifetime, I think we've drew twice with the Pharaohs, which is yep. frightening. Mm-hmm. But um, I'd like to think, no matter who it is, that there is enough talent still in that squad. Because this is, uh, of course, we're joking. We're going to go to the Euros. I'm in. But if we want to go to the Euros and compete. We really have to be picking up wins, ideally against Israel. And no matter who goes out today, we have to be um, uh, winning against the Pharaohs or just wish all your um, as a one-hit wonder then to the Euros. I'm just going to pick up on two points that you brought up there. So the first one is on the the strong midfield, and there's a lot of comments coming in here saying, uh, "Why did Turnbull not get included within that Scotland squad?" And I think when you take a look at it across the sort of Scottish players playing um, this season, Turnbull must have had one of the best seasons. Um, and for me, it does. It is quite flabbergasting that he wasn't even part of the travelling squad for these games. You're playing three games in the space of seven days. You think you'd be able to turn to someone like David Turnbull ahead of someone like Kenny McLean, who came on the other night. Um, and I just don't get that. So maybe that's another thing that doesn't play into Steve Clark's kind of favour when you're looking at a potential next Celtic manager. But also someone, someone who has a Celtic connection is Jack Henry. And Jack Henry came off at half time against Israel. Um, Kevin, you spoke earlier about how we're lacking in that centre half um, mm-hmm. sort of position, especially as we go into the next transfer window. Is Jack Henry someone you'd like to see given a second chance at Celtic? Uh, based on his performance his first time around with us, no. <laughs> um, and I haven't seen him since he's been out in Belgium. So I'm really just going on the reports of him. But by all accounts, he's, he's upped his game. He's improved a lot. And he's, is it the last year or so that he's been away from Celtic on loan? I don't think we can really be too picky at the moment. I would definitely bring him back over the summer and maybe give him the pre-season and see how he gets on. Um, but like I say, I haven't seen enough of him to really know if he's improved to the level that we need for a centre-half. Um, and based on... Henry first time around, I think we should be looking for someone better than him. Mm. Amy, you managed to catch the Scotland games. Did Henry show anything in those games to suggest that he could have a future at Celtic? I certainly thought he was solid enough, um, especially against Austria. I thought he was okay. Um, you can see how comfortable he is in that in that back three. I think he actually would have preferred to have been the middleman. Um, that's what he plays out in, Belg- uh, in Belgium. Sorry. Um, and I've seen little highlights of him. I've seen some of the goals that he scored as well. Um, and like as, as Kev says, by reports, he's doing great. You look at Lewis Laird obviously doing loan watch and you can keep on track of these things. And by all accounts, yeah, they, they're wanting him. So he's, he's doing something right. And like I say, from what I've seen, I'd, I would bring him back and let him have a little uh, a shot. Uh, like I say, it was, I really was quite impressed with him um, the other night against Austria. 
I was at work for the first half an hour of um, the Israel game, so I never really caught that. So he came on, um, when he came on, uh, sorry, when he got taken off, I never really saw a lot of him the other night. But again, I don't think that was really a reflection on him. I think that's more a reflection on we had to lose a defender because we're going to that four two three one. Um, and you're maybe a little bit more stable with with Hanley and Tierney at the back. Hanley's, if Tierney would be bombing forward, Hanley's much more comfortable sitting back and staying and, and being quite commanding. So, well, there's one as well. Who'd have thought Grant Hanley would be back in Scotland set up and back <laughs> starting? And, and there we go. So, um, he's it's, it's a crazy thing the internationals. But yeah, touching on um, Turnbull, Turnbull as well. Sorry. We, we spoke about it at the time, Colin. I think the, the squad was announced on the Tuesday and we came on on the mm-hmm. Wednesday and we yeah. were a bit disappointed that he wasn't um, selected. Mm-hmm. Bringing up Kenny McLean as well, I don't know what Kenny McLean has over Steve Clark. There's some sort of loyalty there for sure. Um, but Kenny McLean and David Turnbull are two very, very different players. Um, McLean's not going to come in and sit and do that role that, that Turnbull would be. Of course, that's McGinn's role. Again, I don't know if the three five two would really suit Turnbull, and that's obviously what Clark came into these games mm-hmm. wanting to yeah. to play. It certainly didn't suit McGinn, um, and it didn't McGinn didn't we didn't get the best out of him until we switched, and he was just sort of sitting behind Christie and, and Dykes and Adams, and and that was where he was comfortable. So I, I would still like to see Turnbull at the Euros, of course I would, because I do think, especially up here, he's doing the best that, um, out of anyone. But mm-hmm. you're not really going to knock John McGinn out of a out of um, the side, no matter how how good he is, um, McGinn's just he's well. There's a, a sad moment we can reflect on what could have been, what should have been. But I, it's just I would like to see him certainly around the international stage. But again, even look when he was at Motherwell, he wasn't always a starter for the twenty ones, and that was mm-hmm. frightening. And um, I remember looking at it and you're like, this is crazy because he, he's ripping up at Motherwell, but. I don't know. Who knows what Stevie Clark's thinking? But it is a really strong midfield, and if um, he's not there, then he's certainly going to get his chance in the future. And you know, you speak about someone, and then suddenly a comment comes in. Here is Lewis Lear, <laughs> um just mentioning about Jack Henry, saying that he's doing very well over in Belgium. They're currently sitting in the Champions League places, and they thought he kept things simple against Austria and played decent. He is someone that will probably come in, and I think he'll get given the preseason. Um, the new manager will give him the preseason if. Uh, and I'll probably butcher the pronunciation of this name. Is it Ustend? Ustend, the team in Belgium, don't take up the um, obligation or option to buy that they have for him. Um, I think you'll probably find that he'll have a suitor somewhere. There's, I know there's interest in England and Germany. So if he is going to have a future at Celtic, then he'll certainly have something um, pretty decent elsewhere. Quickly touch on Connor Hazard, who made his debut for the Northern Ireland. Northern Irish international side against America um, was unlucky not to save the penalty from Christian Pulisic um, and they lost 2-1. A fantastic goal from ex Niall McGinn if you haven't seen it, um, definitely go and check that one out. Um, now Kevin, my good friend Monty in the chat who loves winding me up um, asked me um, about 20 minutes ago to ask you, since we have you on here and you have the Hungarian football expertise, the Euros is going on over there at the minute. Is there anyone that should be part of Celtic's consideration for the rebuild next summer? Is there anyone that really catches your eye? Oh, um, I wasn't prepared for that question. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd, I'd need to go away and do a little bit of digging in on that one because I've really only been watching the, the Hungarian games mm-hmm. so far. Um, and from Hungary, from their side, not really. <laughs> they, um, they did... They just did well enough to get to the Euros uh, at this level. And they've kind of been shown up against, I think it's Germany um, and Holland in the last couple of games. The, the Germans and the Dutch were both kind of mirrored on the, the senior teams. So they're very well organised and they keep the shape as a professional, or as a, like a senior team would rather than the under-21s, very disciplined. So I think you're going to have... There would be players from Germany, from Holland, I think, definitely, that we could probably keep our eye on, but I can't give you a name right now. <laughs> what about in the, the league itself? I know you keep up really well with the, the Hungarian Football League. Is there anyone there that should potentially be on Celtic's radar this summer? Um, again, I'm probably going to say no, mainly because I think the standard of the Hungarian League uh, is its SPL level. Um, Ferencvaros are the best side in the league and at the moment there's something like 
I think 13 points clear, they're kind of running away with it. And we know them. We know the level that they were at. So I think you've got Tokmak, who scored the winning goal at Parkhead. Mm -hmm. He'd be a player that you'd maybe look at if you need the kind of pacey forward. David Shiger, who scored the first goal at Celtic Park. And uh, Igor Harriton, who's the, the other central midfielder. They're probably the you know, like the three I would highlight most from Ferenc Varos' players that, I mean, would be good enough to play SPL level, whether they would be first-team players at Celtic, I highly doubt. Um, and then going through the rest of the league, it's I don't think there's anyone that I would really recommend for Celtic to go for. As, as, a, as a point, David Banasek, that used to play the Hearts, is a, a first pick for Pushkash Academia in that league. So that's that's probably the level that they're at. So there you go, Monty. We've had our Hungarian scouting trip carried out by Kevin. Um, <laughs> only for us here at a Celtic State of Mind. So the so answer to that question, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> your answer to that question is uh, no. So we'll move on and we will talk about some the tournament that is happening in Hungary at the minute though, and that is the, the Euro 21s. Edward playing out there. Um, I've seen a lot of people saying he's 23 years old, he's playing for the 21s. It just shows how long that um, that tournament's actually been running for because of what's happened with the global pandemic. Uh, and you were telling us before we came on air, uh, Kevin, that the tournament's actually split up. So the group stages take place this month and then when does the actual knockout stages take place? Yeah, that's right. So the group stages finish today, I think it is, the last round of games. And then the knockout stages are, it's the end of May and June. Start of June that that takes place. So what it does suggest is that we'll have Odson Edward back for the tie against Falkirk at the weekend then? Yeah, he should be back for that game. France play tonight, uh, I think it's against Iceland. Is that mm -hmm. the game? Uh, so France, they lost the first game against Denmark won the second against the Russians and Edward scored the penalty in that game. So they're second in the group just now, neither win to be sure of getting into the knockouts. And Amy, obviously this puts odds on onto the kind of the global stage. I'd imagine there'll be lots of scouts watching these games, potentially looking at them for the summer transfer window. Um, he just seems to always find his form when he goes to represent his country, doesn't he? Hi, absolutely. It's um, it's one of these recurring themes, isn't it? It's um, you look at the free kicks he bangs in and just his overall play for France is um, absolutely exceptional. So he, he's gone. He's gone. Um, if something, and especially if he, he continues to have a good tournament, obviously as, as Kev says, a win tonight and um, they'll be doing okay. So it's disappointing, but. He's, um, I don't know, he's kicking into gear when he's over in France. That I think a, a gear that he's probably not reaching while he's here, actually. I think that's been the frustrating, frustration thing from a lot of Celtic fans. Is you see him, I think he's now the all-time uh, top goal scorer for France under 21s. Um, and every time you see him, he always seems to score these fantastic goals. But yet, some of the p play that he's had at Celtic this season, it's as if he's been looking for that extra touch. He's been trying to take on one too many men and he's probably not scored as much as he should have done this season. Um, do you think that's maybe just because he, he knows that when he's playing in these games, he's opening himself up to a wider market, Amy, and that maybe he's looking um, to impress some of the scouts and some of the suitors that's watching him? You certainly hope not, because at the end of the day, Celtic are paying his wage, um, put a lot of trust in him at, trust in him at a young age, um, obviously learnt from Dembele and then to continue on from Dembele, and he's done, he's done exceptionally well at that. But as much as he's done well for Celtic, Celtic have done well for him. Not mm -hmm. many 20 year olds or whatever are, are playing in, in Europe and are on a big stage at, like Celtic. Um, there's there's a shortage of strikers out there for, for a reason. Um, we're talking about if we lose Edward, Edward sorry, we're not going to find anybody else. That's because nobody else is on that sort of stage that, um, that he's been on, except obviously from your, your sort of Ellen Hallands and all of that. But we're not getting him anytime soon. So it's... Um, <laughs> well, I've just, well, I think the, did you see the tweet? I think somebody rejected a tweet. I think when obviously when Ronnie Dyla was back at Celtic, I think oh there was a scout looking for Haaland. Of course, we've been looking at everybody for Celtic, but it's one of those ones that's of course we were looking. But no, it's uh, of course it's disappointing. Um, but uh, he's he knows he knows that he's um, there's going to be eyes on him right now. But I'd like to think that he's not just thinking oh stick all my eggs in the one basket for the, the under twenty ones, and he should have been doing exactly the same at Celtic. And Paul brought up a point earlier, and Paul's working in the background and bringing up some points and um, getting involved in the chat. 
but he mentioned the list of players that Ronnie Dyla had developed. Um, and you just wonder if he'd ever managed to get some of those over to Celtic, would he maybe still be here? That's the, there he goes, there's Paul brought it up there. Um, Ivor Fossum, Top Mac Nguyen, Christopher Iyer, Martin Odegaard, they're all important parts of the Norway squad and all products of Ronnie Dyla. It just shows the kind of coach that he was and maybe he just wasn't given the full chance here at Celtic. And maybe he will be taking one of our players, as the rumours go, that Patrick Klamala could be making his way across the transatlantic to New York City. Kevin, thoughts? I'd be disappointed to see him go because I don't think he's ever had a chance with us. And I, I don't know if I'm just the, the optimist on him, but I think there's a player in Klamala. When he's come into games, he's, he's impressed me more often than not, just with his work rate. Um, I think he's he's kind of bulked up over the, the last six months or so. He's a more physical option up front. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I'd be disappointed if he did leave, and I think he, he would leave without having had, had a chance to impress, and that was a mouthful for me to get out there. <laughs> <laughs> Amy, we're not sure if this is going to be a permanent or a loan transfer, but... Um... Is it just a case of the time's up for Klamala at Celtic? Well, if it's permanent or if it's loan, well, to be honest, it doesn't matter which one it is. We're in big trouble. Um, you're looking as well, if Griff's away, Eddie's definitely away. If we're left with just a Yeti, then, wow, we need to, um, they better be working behind the scenes. Because that's, um, that's a little bit of a worry, isn't it? You can't. You go from four strikers at the beginning of the season and we were like, wow, four good Strikers. Oh yeah, bio. Let's forget about bio. Um, if you just about to bring bio up, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm still going to bring him up. Um, if you, um, I don't know. Again, I think that I think whatever bio is over in Toulouse. Is that right? Yeah, league um, two. Oh, league, league two. Oh, right. There you go. I think there's. Um, you never know. He he could be away as well. So yeah, it's, it is a little bit worrying. If, it, I'm not really filled with much more joy now remembering Bio either. Just having Bio and Ayeti, I think that's still a little bit of a worry. Um, I think that the concerns are still there. So, yeah, if he is away to New York, as Kev says, it probably would be a decent run for him. Um, but he's not really been given all of a great chance. It's it's a tough one. It's a tough one, but it's all about him. <laughs> as he yeah, does well. Yeah. Kevin Graham just coming in saying, boom, 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 let me hear you say bio. The, the best part of bio's entire Celtic career was his introduction. When the lights went out, and it was almost like a, a WWF Undertaker entrance, when it just comes up and he's sitting in the centre circle with the ball at his feet. That was just incredible. And that's when his career sadly took a downward turn. Um, that was the best of bio. So if you had a highlights clip, it would just be that so far. <laughs> but you look at it again, it's the same with Clamala. Remember that whole let's get rocking? I've not been rocked. <laughs> He's not rocked your world then. No, not at all. It's no. just like you wouldn't even <laughs> remember all of that. He came with the jumper and it was all the emojis kicking around. Yeah. It's just something's not, I don't know, maybe we should tone everything right down. Um, all of these big intros are just setting them up to fail. So that, That's another clip we're going to have to take of Kevin saying, has uh, Klamala not rocked your world, Amy? That's, that's, <laughs> that's a lunchtime show. Come on. <laughs> uh, this needs to go after the watershed then. <laughs> <laughs> but we are on the... This is traditionally... And here's another one. This is traditionally hump day of the week. Everything goes downhill to the weekend now. We look forward to this weekend's game against Falkirk in the Scottish Cup. Amy, do you see us making many changes for that game? Yes, I do. I am... Um... Don't ask me who, what, when, where, why, but um, I just, I can just see a bit of a shake-up, I really can. Um, I personally wouldn't be surprised to see bar class and goals. Um, I think possibly your defence might be looking pretty similar. I don't know if Laxalt will maybe be too busy on Fortnite, um, but we will, um, we will see. I can see, I can, I can see bar class and goals, I really can. I think that would be the one for me. I think we might see the introduction of Barkas. Um, Kevin Griffiths, another player that's been linked with a move away to Aberdeen, potentially as part of a deal for Lewis Ferguson. Um, I, I think that will start a lot of conversation on whether Lewis Ferguson's good enough for Celtic. Personally, I don't think he is. Um, but could we see um, Lee Griffiths getting some game time against Falkirk at the weekend? I think we could, yeah. Yeah. Um... 
I'm kind of thinking the opposite to Amy, that I don't think we'll change the team around that much for this game. Because I think the Scottish Cup's got so much importance to us now this season. If we don't win it, what is it the first time since 2009-10 that we'll not have won a trophy? Mm-hmm. So I, I think Kennedy will want to, he'll want to go out on a high and win the Cup. So I think we we'll keep a fairly strong team. But if there are to be any changes, and probably Barkas coming in in goals, and probably Griff up front if Edwards probably maybe not going to be 100% fit when he comes back from the international games. So I can definitely see Griff getting a game and probably a swan song for us as well. Mm. Do you think he will make that move in the summer then? Aberdeen's been linked with a move for him? I think he probably will. I mean, it all depends on who the new manager is and what his take on Griff is. But he's a guy that's been under three or four different managers. He's had the same fitness issues with every single one of them. We've had the same promises that he's he's going to get, get over them, he's going to get into shape, and mm-hmm. it's never happened. So I think if we get a new coach in, so a director of football, new coach, modern way of thinking, I don't know if Griff really fits into that. And he'd probably become a bit marginalised, even more so than he is now. So he'd probably want to move and get game time. And if Aberdeen's an option, he's got Scott Brown up there. So yeah, I think, I think, I think that's, that's where the connection is. Yeah. Yeah. Amy Griff to Aberdeen, is it something you could see happening this summer? I can see it happening. I still don't want it to happen. Um, I am just still in that Lee Griffiths camp. Um, as I think he's just been the guy that's has been there for so long. It's the whole. Um, it's it, it's just the way I, I sort of see it. I would I wouldn't like him to go. I know there's there's all these issues and the way that he he, um, he maybe doesn't represent himself and represent the club in the best of light. But I just think at the end of the day, you get him on half form even, and he's still one of the most prolific goal scorers in Scotland. Um, you just see last year that he can still, when he was just given a little bit of a chance, and I, I don't, the whole fitness issues this year as well. Of course, it's a massive, um, it's a massive disappointment to, to mm-hmm. be quite honest. Um, no matter how much of it is true and to what degree to levels, but like I say, he's just so 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 prolific in front of goal, um, and you just give him a little run, and I just see him still scoring against almost anyone and everyone. So just a quick prediction for the weekend, Amy. Celtic Falkirk, how's it going to go? 2-3-0. 2-3-0, I like that, Kev. Mm-hmm. Right, I'll second that. I'll be very happy with that. I think we'll probably see a few changes. Um, I know the name Adam Montgomery's came up. I wouldn't be surprised to see him getting a, a bit of involvement against Falkirk, but I agree with you guys. I think it'll probably be about 3-4-0 for Celtic at the weekend. Um, the game is on Premier Sports, so if anyone has a discount code for Premier Sports... Please let us know because that is a ridiculous price to pay for what could potentially be one game. Um, so do leave that in the, the comments section underwards because I've not seen that email come out from Premier Sports yet. Usually offering you the game for like a fiver or something like that. So uh, it's not part of the additional value at Celtic, but that's another discussion for another day. Um, today I've been absolutely delighted to be joined, um, as usual on a Wednesday, uh, by Amy Canavan. And this week from our Hungarian correspondent, Kevin McCluskey. Uh, it's been great bringing this lunchtime bulletin to you on a Wednesday. Uh, the guys will be back tom- uh, tomorrow for the lunchtime bulletin. Uh, Paul John will be joined by John Paul and Declan. I got it right this week. I got well it done. right. I'm so proud of you. I'm so <laughs> proud. That was so quick. First time as well. Well done. Thanks, pal. Uh, <laughs> but Simi and the Play On guys will be back for Scotland versus the Faroe Islands this evening. Good luck to Scotland. And for everyone who's joined us, please take care, stay safe, and as always, a massive hail, hail.